service. What is up, listeners? Welcome back to another episode of the Full Service Podcast. I am Tank Smith, your host, coming at you on a Thursday this week. Oh boy, got a special episode for you. Shout out to my guest from Tuesday, though, Elena Pierre. Elena is a Tallahassee-based companion. If you have not given her a follow on Twitter and Instagram, give her a follow. She is at VIP Elena Pierre. Elena, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. That was a good time. Today, my guest, Brian Knight, he's a New York City-based escort, adult film actor, as well as the author of the Velvet Collar comic book series. I uh, actually, we tried to set this up for a little while. Somebody on Twitter actually reached out to me and was like, hey, you need to get Brian on the podcast, interview him. Uh, we went back and forth for a little while, so I'm glad we are able to actually make this happen. But uh, we actually, we caught up, I guess, it's been like a couple weeks now. It was like right at the beginning of quarantine. Uh, so everything was locked down. We talk about that. We talk about how he got into sex work, his adult film acting career, his comic books. So much fun. So make sure you stay tuned. He is on Twitter, on Instagram, at BrianKnight66. We are on Instagram and Twitter, at Full Service Pod. Give us a follow. I am at Tank Funkadelic. Sit back, relax, happy Thursday, and I hope you enjoy this interview with Brian Knight. Thanks. Welcome back, listeners. It is Tank Smith. I am excited. I'm so excited for this episode today. My guest, Brian Knight, he is an escort, an adult film actor. He is an author of the Velvet Collar Comics. Brian, I appreciate you being on the podcast. Thank you for having me today, Tank. Hell yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad we're able to set this up. I know, uh, <laughs> I feel like I originally reached out like a couple months ago. Somebody on Twitter hit me up and was like, yo, you got to interview Brian. Um, so I'm glad we're able to able to finally make this happen. <laughs> well, I'm glad we're able to. We're pretty much shelter in place, so we've got a lot of time to talk. Yeah, this is crazy. Listeners, you know you know as well as we, we're living in the age of corona. It's uh, it's crazy out there right now. How is uh, How's everything for you right now, Brian? Well, I'm fortunate that I was able to get away from the epicenter. I, it's um, it's not fun. And that's an understatement. I'm worried for people I love and for people who are still have to work um, outside. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's uh, not not it's not it's ideal. Not, no, it's not. <laughs> so I'm uh, I'm currently in Atlanta. Where uh, where are you based out of? I'm based out of New York City, right in Manhattan. Oh, okay, sweet, nice. How uh, how do you like New York? Well, before this, uh, <laughs> what, what I really liked was a lot of nerdy stuff that people people don't think of. I mean, when you come to New York, people think of Broadway, they think of Central Park, they think of the busyness. There's a lot of history, a lot of firsts. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things about how the whole city was created and how that I like, I like history. I like oh, yeah. finding little hidden, hidden things that go overlooked. Oh yeah. And obviously, I mean, if you, I mean, if you want to get anything done or meet anyone from anywhere in the world, New York is the place to be. That's one of the coolest parts is like, literally it's just like, you can just like walk down a block and hear like 10 different languages it's just like it's so multicultural. It's like you're you're forced to. It's it's cool. I like it. I like it a lot. One of the things that I enjoyed last September. Sometimes um, when I do my job, some days it's very busy, and some days it's not. So um, I went into Queens. Queens is the most diverse ethnic neighborhood in the United States, outside of Los Angeles. So I can. I mean, I tried kosher Indian food. It was, it was, it was really? great. <laughs> oh, wow. I never even thought of that being a thing. That's pretty cool. Was it good? It was, it was, I was surprised, but I actually really enjoyed it. And, um, and there were tons of other things to try there that people overlook. And like I said, people overlook it. Like tourists think of coming to Manhattan and Times Square, but Queens is where a lot of interesting stuff happens if you pay attention for it. Nice. Yeah, it's just like Manhattan always gets a good, like, everyone's like, oh, man, we got to go to Manhattan. Let's go to maybe, like, Brooklyn a little bit. But, yeah, nobody thinks about Queens. Like, Queens is, uh, I, know, I know a bunch of people that live in Queens. It's a nice spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. How, uh, how long have you been in New York? 
Uh, most of my life, my family, my parents were immigrants from South America, and uh, okay. they settled. They settled in Brooklyn first, and then in Manhattan, and um, been here most of my life. A little time in Miami. Um, I went to Rochester, New York, for my college degrees, and spent a lot of time in the Hudson Valley. Sweet, sweet, hell yeah. I know, uh, as I mentioned before, you're an escort, adult film actor, and author of uh, Velvet Collar Comics. When's, uh, can you remember the first time you think you heard of sex work at all? Um, I was in college, and I was in my freshman dorm, and it was just around the time of 9-11 that uh, one, of, one of my floor mates was also coming out. Uh, I wasn't... I wasn't fully gay back then, and I didn't even think about it, but I was interested, and he was, as he was discovering himself, he shared some of his resources and curiosities with me. Uh, he gave me a book called Boy Culture. Logo turned it into a movie many years later. But uh, I read about it, and I read it, and I opened it, and the main character was a sex worker. So that was the first time... I became aware of it, but I mean, at the time, it was it, this was a character in a in in a fictionalized book, and I didn't think of it much. And then later, when I, I went out, I started to go out. I went to the Roxy. It was a club in New York. It was amazing. It, I only went twice, but the memories of those times are like forever part of my memory. And when I was oh, yeah. there, <laughs> when I was there, um, there was an online advertising platform for male workers called Rentboy. And they were having okay. they were having their uh let's see, their fifth year anniversary, I believe it was. Fifth year anniversary. And at the front door was the escort Eric Rhodes. I don't know okay. if you've ever seen pictures of Eric Rhodes, but he was a living god. Okay. I'm gonna have to Google this dude. <laughs> uh yeah, unfortunately he died at thirty um too short but yeah. i mean he was i was so amazed by him and someone i i didn't even know he was an escort and then someone casually asked him well how much do you charge per night now this was like in 2002 and he casually said eh, two to three thousand depends how i feel and i was so <laughs> blown, i was so blown away that someone could be desired that much that they could make a living on it yeah. Um, but again, I didn't think that I would be doing it years later. Like when you heard the the two to three thousand a night, was it, did that kind of get the wheels turning? Like hmm, maybe this is something I could do. Or were you still like, you know what? Like that's a cool number, but that's not anything. Like I don't think I could do that. I was what, uh, what, I was amazed, but I didn't think I could do it at the time. How did you actually uh, get into it? Um. Well. I finished college, and it was about the time the recession was in full swing, and um, people weren't hiring. I spent about two and a half years looking for work unsuccessfully, and then uh, student loans were due. So I looked on Craigslist, and there were ads available. Um, they were looking for carpenters, like basic carpenters. And I did some basic carpeting with my grandfather on his farm when I was in like 15, 16 for a summer. So I didn't know if I could do it. I had no idea, but I had to try because I needed the money. Got to try. So when I answered the ad, I ended up at a funeral home in the middle of nowhere. And one thing led to another. And I made 60 bucks uh banging a guy on an embalming table between two stiffs nice first time ever first time ever it was nice. and i and it didn't bother me at the time the thing that bothered me the most was the cold metal table hitting my thighs that yeah. like like dead bodies no problem cold cold <laughs> table shit that sucks <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> From there, how did you uh so so that happens the first time. And then are you thinking like maybe I could like do this like as a kind of like full time thing or what's what's your what are you thinking at uh kind of like at that point? Well, I had no other options at the time and people were throwing me money to massage them and 
Um, at first it was massage with hand jobs and just, it was, it was very sloppy at first. I had to learn as I went and, yeah. um, but still it wasn't until about the third year where I really tried escorting. Um, and I'd like to state that it wasn't just, it wasn't just a euphemism for fucking them for money. There was a lot of other stuff that I did not realize what was involved. Um, there were so many other things that I didn't know at the time, but about three years later, both my parents were out of work and my brothers couldn't go to school. So, um, a client told me, well, if you escort, you can earn three times the money of what you're doing. And I thought, well, that's, I have to try. Yeah. Do you feel like starting out like uh, escorting, there's like a learning curve? Like, I know, I feel like the longer you do something, you know, the better you get. Do you feel like there was ever a time where you're like, I feel like I wasn't that good at it? Was there, was oh. that, did that ever happen for you? Oh, yeah. I've reflected on that. But part of it is like, you might be total shit, but you have to put on a confidence like, yeah, I know what I'm doing, even if you're shit, because people who hire you are looking for that. If you don't know, if you don't treat yourself with confidence, People won't pay you, even if you're totally incompetent. And, That's true. Um, that was the thing. Like, if I actually tried to talk with early clients about my misgivings, they would just move on to somebody else. And yeah. um, I, re I received this email from a, a someone who claimed to be a former client who said I was the worst that he had ever seen in his entire life. And he just wanted to remind me of that. And <laughs> he reached out like years <laughs> he reached know. out like later and then it was like hey you were terrible just wanted you to know yeah that was um i mean really i don't know if i ever saw him but um that kind of message is is um I think every escort should have at least one of those messages to like keep them grounded not to put themselves down but to let them know hey you you can still fuck up so you got to be you got to stay on top of what you're doing i feel like see i feel like that's actually a good thing right cuz doing like stand up right you can't if it goes well all the time i feel like you don't get better you know i feel like you have to you have to have that like adversity and almost just like not doing well to be like god damn it you really got to pick your shit up you got to do better and you know i feel like i feel like it helps if, well, if it's if it's worded in the right way, you know. If <laughs> oh no, this wasn't worded in the right way. Like one of the one of the amazing and awful things about escorting is that because of the nature of the because of the nature of the existence and how things are dealt, there is no filter. Like like if people think you're shit, they will tell you to your face, and yeah. they will and they will tell you exactly everything that's wrong with you. Uh, <laughs> Conversely, it allows me to say shit that I never thought I would dream of saying, and and sometimes it's been re it's been really cathartic. Yeah, I mean, granted, I can't you can't do that all the time because you still. What I was one of the things I was surprised at was that eventually you start meeting other escorts and people talk, and if you are shooting your mouth off all the time, people talk and it gets back to people who think, mm, maybe I don't want to be with this guy. So oh, that, that's true. I didn't think so, of that. So even in this informal organic setting, there are still like customs to be observed, like in, in like a normal office setting, which I was really surprised at. Damn. When you when you started, do you feel like there was anybody to kind of like help you along the way, or you, is it still like you on your own, kind of like learning as you go, or is there somebody you can kind of like look up to and be like have questions for? Is the community feel like supportive at that point, or where you you can reach out to people, or how's how's that work? Um, I had zero mentors starting. I had zero mentors in the business. Um, most people don't have mentors in the business, and I'll come back to that because that's a that's a tricky. Uh, that's a tricky thing uh, to think about. I didn't have any kind of like real friends or mentors until a few years after I started doing it. And even then those were kind of, those had their own customs to observe. So I would have to say originally my partner, I've been with him for 16 years. Um, he 
was we knew each other before I started working and he made sure to keep telling me um, these are people. They're people first. They're not dollar signs. They're not. Yeah. So he, so in that way, he was very much on top of me. It's like, um, they're still people first. So yeah. don't, don't, don't treat them like they're disposable. Don't treat them like they're, um, like, like they're just dollar signs. Um, is it, is it easy to do, is it easy to see people like that when, when you are like escorting? So one of the things that happens, anybody who's successful, like if you come to a point where lots of people are talking to you, you start making decisions. You start deciding who do I want to spend time with? Who is, who is going to make my life better? And that's a question that we're all asking, but like asking it up front seems really offensive to people because it's like, well, why are you excluding me? Aren't I worth it? Isn't my time worth as much as yours? And um, the fact is we all don't have enough time for each other. We only have a certain amount of time in our lives for a certain number of people, and we have to make decisions. So one of the things that happens is that you start making decisions. You start thinking, well, if I spend time with so-and-so, I, I enjoy this and I enjoy that. But if I spend time with so-and-so, I get this and that. Yeah. So, and I, and I, and I say it like that, like, in, like, depending what your priorities are, like, if you want a lot of money, if you want a lot of freedom, if you want a lot of connections, if you want personal time or if you, so whatever the priority is. That makes sense. What do you think? Did you have, do you think you have a most important thing you learned starting out? Well, one of the first things I learned that surprised me was that uh, I didn't do it originally because I thought I was fat and I didn't think that people would think I was attractive enough to do it. But I was surprised even without abs or my dick is eight inches when it's fully hard and I'm a grower, not a shower. So it's not. Aren't we all? Aren't we all? Yeah. But it's, but you know what? I was surprised that. I was surprised to find a lot of people who were willing to support me uh, who didn't prioritize that. As, okay. Yeah, yeah, they wanted they wanted other things. They wanted they wanted a lot of things that I had, and that was that was a surprise. Um, I think a lot of guys who enter the business think that they either have to be like the most beautiful in the world, and they just and they don't have to be by a particular aesthetic they just but they need other skills that makes okay that makes sense mm -hmm. okay cool do uh do people uh in your life know like i know you mentioned your partner he knows um do, uh, do people close to you also know about your work yeah i'm i'm, uh, I'm pretty open with most people i have to be careful like um like i can't tell my neighbors i can't tell my i can't tell anyone near uh, near where I live. Um, yeah. Cause, I mean, because unfortunately the work puts me in a more vulnerable position. There's, there's a lot of hidden hostility. So don't want to make enemies. I mean, if I go abroad, it's like, uh, even in an Uber, like someone will ask, well, what do you do? And, uh, if I tell them there's a good chance to like knock my rating down, it's such a stupid thing. But really? Yeah. Like, if like, they they could like if they don't like you or if they like have an issue with you they'll just knock your rating down and that's not a big thing but if you take Uber and if you take and if you take those things or like um that can affect other parts of your life I was really surprised about that like um if I'm in a safe place where I don't feel like it's gonna get back to me like in Vegas like if I'm at a block if I'm at a table and people ask sure I'll tell them because yeah. Because, yeah, it's fine, but, like, I was surprised that a couple of Uber riders actually, like, com like made complaints about me. Like... That's fucking... That, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> that, just, that makes no sense. That's, that's fucking... That's insane. That's crazy. Yeah, people are stupid. <sighs> wow. Yeah. When, uh, when you initially started, uh, was there, like, a platform you're advertising on, or is there, like, websites uh, well, that you're initially advertising on? Well, originally I advertised on Craigslist because it was free and that's all I knew. And then later 
I found sites like Men for Rent Now, which is gone. Rent Boy, which is gone. Um, a lot, um, a lot of platforms. There, there aren't many left. There's like one, two left at the most, and uh, social media, and uh, and the apps, and that's it. Where do, where do you feel like most of the people? Do, do a lot of people contact you? Like they'll see you on Twitter, see you on Instagram, and contact you, or find your site through that, and then contact you? Or do you find, do you know how people find like find you? I guess it depends. It depends on the professional. Uh, again, it's changing because um, directory based websites almost don't exist anymore. Um, so it's harder to direct people. Oh, okay. So the method has been to just get a lot of followers and get people to pay attention and then talk privately and then talk privately. Okay. Um, because if you're too open about it, these social media platforms will make you disappear. Yeah. No fucking shadow. Shadow banning is a real thing. Like that just, that happens to people. Wow. Do, uh, Oh yeah. So screening is a, is a thing that I talk to everyone about, you know, it's, it's super, your safety is of the utmost importance. Do you, does, does referral system kind of work? Does, does that happen on the male escort side? I'm, I'm like, I'm, I don't really, I've interviewed a one male escort in Atlanta. Um, and he said there wasn't his, in, in terms of like referrals and stuff, that wasn't a thing for him. I know it's a, for female escorts, it is. Is that a thing you do? Is like is referrals a big thing, or how's it? Um, men don't do that. Okay. Um, so, um, we do. We used to have a directory where we could report abusive and violent or shady callers, but those were removed. Um, some of us will keep those lists and share it with our own individual networks. But there's no central location to share our information. Okay. So um, women do it because they face violence more more often. So as far as screening, um, there's a risk. I have conversations with people before I talk with them. Um, based on my experience, there are things to listen for. Um, yeah. But um, it's a it's an uphill battle because um, law enforcement they they read. They read Twitter and they see all the information we pass to each other and they study it and they change their language and their approach to sound legitimate. And then um, they trap people and hurt them with the information we're trying to use to keep each other safe. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's it's um, it's uh, it's evolving. I mean, um, I did get hit once. It was very costly. And um, very up and very traumatic. Um, I haven't been hit since then, but it's not. Um, uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about uh, it's. Uh, I learned a lot about how to be safer. But yeah, it's, it's a it's a it's an uphill struggle. I know. Uh, I know you're like six six. Do you ever feel like uh like physically like physically like uh like unsafe at all? Like like. I mean, you could take pretty much anybody, but is there, is there ever a time where you're like, I, 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 I don't know if like this well, is sketchy? No, I mean, if someone brings a knife or a gun, being six six isn't gonna help. That is true. So, um, most of the time, most of the problems are solved through conversation. Yeah. So, there's certain things I listen for. Um, like I listen. Does the person show concern for my needs? Um, are they able to communicate well? Um, and are they able to keep commitments? Um, okay. So if they're able to check off these things, um, 99% of the time, they're okay. Okay, sweet. And it's like, I understand that clients have concerns. And if they're not able to acknowledge the concerns of the professional or they think that the concerns of the client dominate the professional, um, then they're no good. For sure. I agree with that 100%. I know you uh you mentioned that you've been in a relationship the past sixteen years. How is being in a relationship and also escorting doing adult film? How's how's that work? Um, I'm very lucky. Again, we met three years before I started to go into the business. So we already had a solid relationship. He's been very supportive, looks out for me, talks with me regularly about his concerns. Like I'm very lucky he's not a jealous type. Like he's yeah. not so so like he's not jealous if I go if I'm with someone. But he does let people know, let me know, like, hey, you promised to be here. 
at this time with your phone off and I'm holding you yeah. accountable. And then he says, well, if you're, if you, when we're together, we're together. Don't, don't break it up. Uh, yeah. And leave some, and make sure you leave some energy for me. Um, so, I feel like having having that clear line of communication definitely has to be a positive thing. I'm in a really unusual situation because he is he literally has the patience of a saint. I know people in mixed relationships are they face a lot of struggles like some of my contemporaries like when they're off the clock they don't want to fuck. I've had days yeah. with the, I've had days like that and it makes him disappointed. He understands but um makes me sad too. Um, sometimes I'll be really emotionally drained because it can be really emotionally draining and, yeah. and there's not for him. So, um, and, uh, it's, uh, also like when we came back to like making decisions, like I, sometimes I'll get offers for hookups off the clock and I'll turn, I'll turn a lot of them down. Not because like. After people have paid to spend time with you, you really pay attention to the kind of person you're talking to. So if you're going to spend time with someone, you want to make sure that they really appreciate you. Like this one time I, I hooked up, didn't tell him who I was. He was late. He was boring. And he gave me gonorrhea. And I was so angry. <laughs> I was so angry. And the next time he wanted to hook up, I said, no. And it's like, and, and, uh, pretty much after that, it's like, I, I always remember that. And it made me think, well, um, is this guy worth gonorrhea? Yeah, for sure. Cause I mean, at least if you're going to get gonorrhea, at least get it from like somebody awesome, you know, or not somebody who's boring. You can't be getting boring gonorrhea. That's, oh that's not, that's no good. It was boring. It was so boring. <laughs> Who uh who would you say your average uh, clientele is that contacts you? Every like if you want to, like age, if you want to use age, race, demographic, is that like a that's it? Well, when you're younger, older people hire you because they have money, and then when you're old, and then when you're older, younger people hire you who have money. Okay. Yeah. I guess um, that makes sense. So I mean, they generally, t I mean, in the East Coast, they tend to be white, middle class. Or upper class uh, business owners. Business owners were my thing. I know escorts who've been hired by celebrities, congressmen, princes, big CEOs, but those guys right. are, are have very specific tastes. Yeah. And a professional can expect to get one, maybe two big ones like that in their in their career. But uh, me, I just I, I look like a Midwestern guy, so I attract I attract a lot of like middle-aged white white men um i'll get in the west coast i'll get more china more chinese and japanese visitors um, okay and when i'm down south more bears so bears bears love me <laughs> so in uh before you see somebody is there a lot of pre-date communication to like know like what they're actually looking for well, yeah, so I mean, is it kind of like, are you kind of going to this, like, uh, they might want whatever, you know, or how does that, how's that work? So, legally, we're not allowed to discuss what we do during the paid time. So, the way to talk about concerns like that are, like, I do film. So, I mean, it's perfectly legal for them to ask me about my films and what I did in my films. It's perfectly legal for them. Um, to talk about films that they enjoyed, so as long as we're as long as we're observing as as we're observing that, it it usually it usually sends the message across clearly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I keep it legal. Yeah, you got to keep it legal. That's how they that's how they get you is that explicit shit. <laughs> Once it gets explicit, that's where it's like this this, this is illegal. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean it's there and um and. Always, always, always listen. Like we used to have great classes on on just staying legal and how to talk and communicate, and a lot of those have broken down. I don't know what new professionals are doing, but at least when I was learning, I had at least had some guidance on how to conduct myself on a phone. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 
Mm-hmm. Well, I know uh, you mentioned, you mentioned the gonorrhea, dude. How uh, how often do you get tested? Um, every three months. Um, and uh, anybody who's on prep has to get tested every three months. I get tested every two to three months just because just um, my clinic offers it for free. Um, okay, sweet. Nice. My clinic is one of the few that's really understanding. Um, and they said, well, we know the job you're in and for public health reasons, you got to do this X, Y, Z. Okay, sweet. Nice. Which is so funny. It's like, I don't know if you've ever looked at Germany or other countries that have regulated sex work, but sex workers actually get tested more frequently than the government mandated um, testing. Really? <laughs> yes. Nice. Yes. But it's so, <laughs> so it's like, um, this idea of like legalization and regulation is total bullshit. <laughs> See, so I was talking to, I was talking to my ex about this today, actually. And so she mentioned something about legalization. And then I mentioned decriminalization. What do you think? What's the best path, path, path forward? Decriminalization or legalization? What do you think? Okay. Let me put it to you like this. I don't okay. know if you're, I'm, I'm going to presume you're gay for the purposes of this exercise. All right. Um, which is better, decriminalizing gay people or legalizing where gay people can have relationships? Uh, I mean, I, I'm not really sure. Legal, 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 uh, decri- is it cri- criminal? I'm decriminal. I'm not really sure. I don't know. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so until 1972, being gay was a, considered a mental disorder. So imagine, imagine a gay person being told where they could have sex, when they could have sex with, letting everyone know they were gay, like on their report card um, for oh, police, geez. or for police or anyone who wanted to like consider having them as a tenant, getting government regulated testing to make sure they don't have HIV and are not spreading it to others. You see where this is kind of going? Yeah, that's crazy. It's like the fucking fucking Nazi Germany with the stars, dude. That's okay. So, um, so when I when I tell people like that, especially like in the queer community, they're like, "Oh, I get it. That's why." And people will say, "Well, it's a health issue." It's like, uh, you're. So these are usually people who are talking who've never like talked to anybody in the business. Like they've Not never sure. ever talked to anyone. So I obviously I'm pro decrim. Because we already have, so as soon as you decriminalize sex work, you suddenly have all these laws um, for protecting independent workers, contractors, um, freelancers that all get activated. They all, oh, nice. so all these laws that are already on the book would suddenly be activated and cover sex workers. Um, like health insurance would be available. Um, there would be, Basically, all the laws are there. And like, okay. like for instance, like people say, well, what if they have HIV and they transmit it to someone and they lie about it to make money? I said, okay, we already have laws about that. They're already there. They're already covered. And all these other laws that we have about businesses not endangering the, the health of their customers, they're already there. So people who like say they want legalization... Um, they don't really understand how their laws work. They don't See, that's the, that's mm-hmm. okay. That's a, that's the thing. That's the thing I thought because I'm like with this whole legal. Like I think like with the whole like legalization of weed, right? Everyone's like, oh, this is it's great thing, but they put so many regulations on weed. The fucking price of weed went up in California. It fucking sucked. I don't, I don't like it. Well, but also if, if weed were decriminalized, then there, there wouldn't be any like penalties for you could still smoke weed if you wanted to you know now now legitimately like okay so you have you have legalization in weed especially it's a product that people consume so it's totally okay to over for the fda to oversee it like because um yeah that's bad people can fuck with the stuff to make money to just make to make a buck um so ha, there, some oversight is good, especially for like products consumed by the masses. So I, I'm totally okay with government regulation on 
um, on products that are for public consumption. No problem. I, I think that's a good thing. Um, as far as regulation goes, like um, basically in this case, it, it was a cash grab. Like the government said, oh, we can make money off of this. Yeah. That, that's, that's what it really came down to. But for instance, like it's, I have a lot of thoughts on it, but I, but I could go on and on on that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. But decrims, decrims the path forward. That decrims the best path forward. Do you think? Yeah, because um, we already have the laws in place to take care of all, almost all the concerns that are being brought up by critics, um, and it offer so people still have to pay their taxes on their income. People still have to take care of their health and the health of others. Uh, people still, uh, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, we. Um, it's that so we already have the laws in place. The 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 restriction, um, the critics have um, the one thing I, I can talk about the critics. I've really been thinking about the critics because in issue four, I'm writing issue four right now, and I had to really study anti-sex work positions in depth to really understand where they were coming from. So I've had a chance to really like jump in and and try to see it from their side. So you said so you you're working on issue 4 right now your uh, comic book Velvet Collar Comics how long uh, how long have you been working on it Um I started back in 2016 after the closure of Rent Boy I was already um planning some comic ideas and then when that happened I thought this is important this needs to be priority and I need to put this in production before um before I lose the opportunity I felt it was important to record the culture, the people, as they were, without having to go get permission from a publisher or from someone else, that we would tell it in our own voices the way we experienced it and remember what it was actually like to be us. Because yeah. our histories are primarily oral and myth, it, it's pa and it's passed down one to the other. And the, the, so it's very patchy and a lot of it disappears. And I thought that that I would not want that to disappear. You're trying to solidify this history forever. And it's comic. only a fraction. It's only this small, tiny, tiny fraction. But I decided that I would do it. Hell yeah. That's awesome. I uh, I listened to one of the other podcasts you did. And you mentioned like every person in the comic book is like a real person that you know? Yes. So, um, what's cool. So... They're either telling their own stories or they're telling stories of other workers or they're an amalgamation, an amalgamation. So, okay. yeah, but you can talk to almost every one of the characters in real life. Um, so I wanted to use real performers and clients and friends and allies as characters in the series. Um, their social media um, power also allows fans to come and support the comic and they get a nice boost of promotion so it's it's a win-win oh yeah and this uh so it follows five uh is it five male escorts uh, working in new york city okay so it follows uh five it follows five escorts that were originally in new york and they were going to be the next top models for the male escort uh, advertising platform based on Rent Boy, and on the day that they're going to sign their contracts, the raid happens, and oh, fuck. and the agency gets closed, and their world is over. So then it pivots into uh, a spy adventure in issue two, and it continues through issue three, and I'm going to continue it through issue four. But now that we have the COVID nineteen pandemic. I'm rethinking how to write future issues because yeah. I, I felt I needed to incorporate the real world into what was happening. And I, ha I, I originally had a plan for the nine issue limited series. And uh, after, after issue four and five, I'm, I'm reconsidering how to do it because I felt it was important. This, yeah, I, yeah. I definitely understand. Cause it's like, once you're like, you want to the audience wants to be able to relate to the people and if they're going through this whole corona thing and uh all the people in the comic book arts are also as well i feel like people are going to be able to relate to that more and really feel that yeah 
but also that's <laughs> that takes a lot of work to rewrite to rewrite do all the illustrations on this on this new thing that happened like that's that's a big it's a big challenge i would feel like well it's the illustrations aren't done yet it's all words on paper right now but um i i i started to fantasize about like almost like a like an ap- uh, apocalyptic odyssey and i thought oh, oh, nice. but one of the it's tough the in the writing i'm talking about some serious subjects but I wanted to remember the joy and the excitement and all of the wonderful experiences that we had as well. Because a, uh, a lot of works on sex workers talk about the struggles, the mundane, banal things, the, uh, the riches and exposure to the 1% that most people can never get. And... And, and those have been done, but uh, I've never seen people really like celebrate some of the joys that we get to experience. Um, yeah. I, I also want to take this time to plug Tina Horn, who wrote uh, the series Safe Sex, which is available through Image Comics. Uh, she was working at the Rent Boy office the day the raid happened, and she created her own comic series based on the events just like I did. But oh, wow, we, nice. we produced our comics independently of each other without knowledge of the other for more than two years. Oh, shit. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. So there are two comic series inspired by the same, um, by the same original event. And hers, it's mostly female and non-binary and queer. And mine is mostly, like, decidedly male. And okay. Her f- series focuses on justice, and my series focuses more on joy. Um, okay, cool. But I, I read her whole series, all six issues. I gobbled them up, and reading her made me really think about, all right, I, I want to make something fun, but I also have to really say something that matters. Yeah. That's key is just, like, finding – because a lot of people tell a story, and you're like, I want to tell, like – a lot of people can tell a story, but telling a story differently, telling the same story differently with different elements is is key to having people to really feel that, you know? Right. Adult films, right? How long have you been uh, working in adult films? About 10 years. Okay, sweet. How did you, how did that uh, happen? Or how did you start doing that? Well, my, I was invited to do my first film in November 2009 uh, in Sunnyside, Queens. Um, okay. They found me on on the website, and they said if I wanted to do a film with them. Okay, cool. How uh, since then? Like I saw on your website, it's like thirty three, uh, like thirty three scenes you've done, or is it more since then? Or about thirty three, yes. What uh? How do you like? Do you like? Would you? What do you have a favorite thing? Like, is there a like? Do you like doing adult film more, escorting more? Is there like a a better thing? I don't. Know. No, I like escorting. I like one on one um, filming. I like filming once in a while, but um, it's a lot of prep, a lot of a lot of preparation. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And and now that people that performers are responsible for marketing their own content and monetizing their own content, it's just more than triple the work. Oh yeah, because you get. I mean, marketing is marketing is huge, and <laughs> you can spend all day doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, man, is this was it like all like kind of like independent or is there like major studio work or how? Uh, well, what, the, what biggest, you... the biggest uh, studio I ever worked with was Pride Studios with Trenton Ducati, and that was for one scene um, in Palm Springs. Um, I was never offered any any big parts because of my body type or because I I did bareback porn early on and. Many studios didn't want um, bareback performers uh, doing condom work afterwards. Oh, uh, like is like really? Mm-hmm. Do you know why that is? I wonder the why. Was, the way it was explained to me at the time was that it would uh, make that viewers would think that uh, oh, it would be okay. safe or or getting STDs, and it was all this. And then afterwards, it was like, well, you're not what we're looking for. Damn. Mm-hmm. That's some bullshit. That's some bullshit. 
I do. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I get that though. They'd be like, "Oh, why are you wearing a condom now? What's up?" Okay. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. If, if um, a lot of condom performers will go bareback afterwards, but if I had to go back and tell myself in porn, I would have said, "Oh, I'll do condom porn first as long as you can." Would you? Is it? Is there a lot of condom porn happening? I feel like most of the. I mean, I'm watching like straight porn, but there's usually no one's wearing condoms. Uh, is it like is like a in the gay community like is there a lot of condom porn? Is that like a thing? It's weird. Like straights are are given permission to have condomless sex, but gays are not. Really. And then, okay, you can have condomless sex, but we're not gonna. We don't want you for these for these big parts. That's some that's some bullshit. People need to know about this. This is. That's, this, this has been an open secret for more than 30 years. I never even knew about this. It's crazy. That's, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I didn't know that. No. Well, I guess I'm not really doing much research. Well, yeah, I mean, if, I mean, if you're straight, why would you care? Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm not even thinking about it. I never, yeah, I never even thought about that. That's damn. Mm-hmm. Do you think, uh, do you think since starting your view on sex has changed at all? Oh, definitely. Um, I have lots of thoughts about it, so you might want to narrow down the question. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. Just like going, like how, just like how you view sex, like initially before you started escorting, before you started doing adult films. Do you feel? Do you see sex the same way now, or do you see it? Do you see it differently? I mean, that's still the same question. I didn't really broaden. I didn't really narrow it down at all. Well, um, I guess sex is sex, but um, my priorities have changed. I really, I think more about who I really want to be with. Like after this, I really want to be with my with my partner, and I just he likes it really rough, and I like it really romantic. He says, "No, choke me, slap me, hurt me." <laughs> yeah, it's like no, I want to cuddle. <laughs> you get. I guess you got to find like a medium in between to where it's like, oh, this is good for me and for that person. Yeah, but he's wonderful. So, hell yeah, I still, I still enjoy having sex with him. Fuck yeah. Do you? Uh, has your view on like men changed at all? Like you're like, I know like some people view clients differently after doing after escorting for a while. Do you view your clients at all uh, any differently since starting? Yeah, it came in stages. So the first was becoming aware that what people say they want may be different from what they actually want. Okay. That was a big thing. Another thing was, um, let's see, um, and what they want can change depending on how horny they are. Okay. And then everybody, everybody is, everybody is thinking, well, what's, what's best for me? Uh, okay. So, and that's okay. Like when you hear it straight, when you hear it on paper, it can sound super selfish, but what it actually means is that people are generally thinking about themselves. They're thinking about what do I need? And if it, ha if what they need happens to be what you're offering or what you want to, wonderful. You two have a, you two have a, an equitable exchange that you're both happy with. But this idea of like, exchanging and negotiating constantly. So I'm very aware that there's all this negotiating going on. And there were, when I started, there was a lot of stuff I took for granted or I assumed that people felt the way I did about. Okay. But that's, but that's, that's not, that wasn't the case really. No, before, I mean, I assumed everyone thought the same way I did and felt the same way I did. And then I found out there were lots of different ways that people could feel about the very same thing. Okay, yeah, because every, every, yeah, everyone's different. Like everyone has different experiences that shape who they are, and that's going to shape how they view everything. So yeah, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like attraction plays a role in seeing clients at all? Well, at least for me, um, personality makes the most difference. I'm open to a wide variety of body types, but um, if I like the personality, I can find a lot of other things sexy about them. Nice. What uh? What would you tell somebody who wants to get into like male escorting? What would you tell somebody right now? 
Um, um <laughs> yeah, what would you tell them right now? Because people are going to be listening to this right now. What, what would you say? Okay. So these are the things you need to be successful when this pandemic is over. Okay, sweet. Number one, be healthy. Like, you want to be as healthy as you can in whatever form that looks like. Maybe you're skinny and you do yoga. Maybe you're a buff and a bodybuilder. Maybe you're a basketball. But whatever it is, be healthy and and really focus on having a lot of vitality. Okay. Two, um, learn a lot of stuff. Like, the people... Think about the people who have money. They're Chinese, Russian, German. Um, they're business owners. You want to know the things that they know, so that you can, so they think that you're one of them. That's Kanaya. You want to connect with them. Yeah. Two, um, study money management. Like learn everything you can about what to do with your money uh, to make it work for you. Uh, a lot of professionals like. They don't think about it. To them, it's just a job. They'll do it sometimes, make a little money, pay rent. That's it. Move on to the next thing. But have a goal for the future. Like originally, my goal was do a bodybuilding show. Did that. Put my brother through college. Did that. Pay off my student loans. Did that. Um, pay for this comic to come up. Did that. Now, my contacts allow me to are literally all, all the good people I've met doing this work and all the good relationships I formed with them, they're letting me survive through this pandemic. They're literally, they're literally like chipping in piece by piece to make sure that I'm okay. And it was because it wasn't because I was, I, I just tried to treat them as good as a real person and try to have mm -hmm. authentic, real relationships with them. Yeah. Oh, do you ever feel like a uh, pressure to live up to clients expectations in a session at all? Oh, constantly. How is dealing with that? Well, you either can do it or you fake it. So, oh, okay. or, you, or in like, um, one of the things I learned is that if I'm not ready or able to do something, don't do it. Like, I had this one guy who kept pressuring me for months to get on a phone session with him to do a leather dominant master role play. And he would either catch me at the wrong time. Or I just wasn't feeling it. But he asked me like a yeah. hundred times. And I finally realized it's like, okay, I'll try it. And then like 10 minutes into it, he literally starts cussing me out and saying I'm the ugliest, worst person that he's ever role played with. And I hung up on him. <laughs> God damn, bro. That's fucked up. It was fucked up. It damn. was fucked up. But I was not ready. And yeah. I, I was I was just not feeling it. So like I shouldn't have done it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does uh does erectile dysfunction ever play a role at all? Like how does? Well, sure. Every man has it if they don't if they don't do the exercises and keep up with their health. Okay. Mm hmm. So if you're healthy, it's good. It's fine. Everything mm -hmm. works good. Yep. But, but um, yeah. I, I tell people learn your exercises. Exercise regularly. Learn your ex. There's ex exercises. Oh yeah. Like, I need to Google these exercises. Yeah, it's interesting. There's there's whole regimens for it. Damn, fuck yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do some Googling after this shit. Mm -hmm. um, how is it? Uh, so uh, originally, so I'll see, I'll, so I'll follow you on Twitter. Uh, somebody from Twitter initially contacted me to hit you up for the podcast. Um, how is it like having fans? How is that? I like it. Um, oh, yeah. People will send me nice notes. I'll just say hello. Um, I like knowing that what I made for them makes them happy. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes, um, there'll be little perks here and there. I'm like, I want, like right now, I love black beans. My The love of my life makes the best black bean soup in the world. And he makes yeah. it this very specific brand of Goya beans. So I put out this call on the internet. I need these beans, this very specific brand of beans. <laughs> so now I, I've told all my all my followers, please send me these beans. <laughs> so <Hell yeah. laughs> they are so, they are sold out at Walmart, at stores everywhere. But you're are you able to were you able to get some? Did anybody send you any? A couple of people said they would. Nice. See now that's good. Like I need to I need to I need to get fans just so that I can get I can do something like that. That'd be nice. What's yeah. your what's your comfort food? 
Uh, I'm, I'm, I like Mexican, so I'm going to go enchiladas. Enchiladas are my, uh, that's my thing. <laughs> All day, every day. I can every day. You. Yeah. Yeah, my, com- <laughs> my comfort food, um, it's his black bean soup. And my mother makes a, like a cheese yuca bread called chipas. Okay. So those are my two, those are my two favorite comfort foods. Fuck yeah. I love me. I love foods. Food's my thing. I'm a, I'm a fan. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hell yeah. Is there anything you're working towards for you? Know, like uh, any goals or anything? I know you're, uh, you got your episode f- or work, ep- issue four you're working on. Is there any kind of goals or anything you want to see yourself in the future? What's, what's up for Brian in the, in the future? Well, issue three, issue three and four. That's first. I'm, I, I just am reprioritizing right now because I'm expecting to be in this lockdown for three months, maybe longer. So yeah. I'm just taking the time to really reconnect with myself because one of the things you do with this work, you think about everybody else and everybody else's needs, but you don't think about your own. Yeah. So I'm taking this quiet time, hopefully reflect, hopefully learn more about myself and reconnect with the things that make me me. Fuck yeah. Yeah. How are you? How are you looking at this time off? Like, are you kind of excited about it? Are you kind of like, I wish I, I wish I could be working right now? Or are you kind of like, one day at a time? How, how are you feeling about this? Uh... I'm a little sad that I won't see people that I love and care about for some time. Um, yeah, I'm con- I'm anxious about what's going to happen next. I hope we get. <clears throat> I mean, realistically, everybody is like doesn't want to talk about what's really going on. But I was trained as a scientist. I was trained um, to look at data and to observe and read, and um, it's not good. I mean, I've actually like started leafing through the diary of Anne Frank again, Um, not because we're facing Nazi Germany, but because, I mean, realistically, we could be looking at a couple of years, like to be really safe from this disease that's ravaging the planet right now. I mean, imagine if you were stuck in your apartment for two years and you couldn't, and you couldn't, and you couldn't leave. Yeah, I mean, I've been here like five days. This shit sucks. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I'm, no. I'm just, um, I'm curious. I'm curious to see how things are going to change. Yeah, but that's it. Literally, just being grateful. I'm being grateful. I'm safe and helping where I can for now. I hope okay. that I hope that listeners there. Are, staying in touch with the people they love. I hope that they're safe. I hope that they speak up for things that are important and that um, they don't lose that. They, they really focus on what's the truth and that they focus on uh, helping each other get through this trial. Yeah. Cause we can Definitely. do it if we work together. For sure. I know. Uh, I know. Before we started talking, you had mentioned there was a couple places that maybe people could donate, or maybe organizations that are doing a uh, doing positive things in the community right now. Do you? Is there anything you want to plug? Or is there anybody you want to shout out? Um, if you do, I'll make sure I put like links to their uh, websites or GoFundMe's or whatever that may be on the website <laughs> page. I would actually, I mean, ironically, PayPal, GoFundMe, and Venmo are actually closing down fundraisers for sex workers. They're really? Fuck. Yeah, they are. Um, it's awful, but they are. Um, so I would actually encourage people to actually take the time to go online, actually talk and learn about the people who are in the business and talk with them directly because I mean, a lot of this is under the table. Like it's literally like a lot of it is like, there'll be a part-time worker who's trans disabled dealing with health issues and has no money. And she's like selling what little jewelry she can or like camming to just get rent because she doesn't know if her landlord is going to kick her out or not. And yeah, these people aren't making it. They're not going to receive aid. They're not going to be a large part of the conversation and they're going to be left out. So I think it's, it would be good for every person listening to this to pick one or two people, really get to know them and listen to them, not in a voyeuristic condescending kind of way, but really listen to them and understand them and then speak and then 
let other people know, hey, this person's good. Give them a hand or give them some help. Um, okay, sweet. You can. There are plenty of of swap chapters throughout the country, and you can donate money to them. And some of them will go through, um, but a lot of them won't. Um, I think what PayPal and Venmo and Square Cash are doing is um, quite horrible, but they're the ones who are controlling it. So um, there's no point in ignoring the reality of it, and you just have to find a way to work around it. Yeah, I guess that's all. Yeah, I guess that's all we can do at this point. Right. But hope, hopefully, it changes uh, the future. I hope so. Yeah. Well, Brian, I uh, appreciate you coming to the podcast. This, is, uh, this has been a lot of fun. Your comics, Velvet Collar Comics. Uh, is there a place where people can buy these? Yes, they can go to www.velvetcollarcomics.com. Um, issue one is currently listed. Issue two is available for sale. Uh, we're, we'll be adding some more. Uh, we'll be adding some more uh, options for sale shortly. Um, also, I'm running a special right now. Um, a lot of workers are, um, don't have money. So if someone wants to buy a comic and donate the money toward that particular person, um, all the sales, all the sales of digital copies will go to the name person. Okay, cool. Nice. Especially if they're workers. Oh, nice. Okay. Fuck yeah. This is, this is my way to try to get some money back toward... Uh, toward workers who are really struggling right now. Yeah, hell yeah, that's awesome. You were uh, you're on Twitter and Instagram uh, at Brian Knight six six. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Hell yeah, sweet. Well, yeah, what I'll do, I'll uh, I'll pl- I'll plug it uh, in the intro and outro, and I'll put a link to both your Twitter and Instagram on the Libsyn page, so that everybody can check that out. Thank you. But, uh, we're also yeah, yeah. we're also looking for comic book artists and illustrators for different projects. So if anyone listening uh, sees the art and may be interested, we're looking especially um, for artists and creatives uh, who are workers in nightlife. We're trying to find uh, ways to get them some money during this hard time as well. Hell yeah! This kind of this is kind of funny, right? I just thought, have you ever been working with an artist and they're like great at everything, but they just can't draw a dick? Yes. Yes, I have. How <laughs> have you ever been like, hey, you're gonna have to really go home, Google a bunch of dicks, and then like, then come back with some samples? It, How's that work? Does that ever work? So, like, so what happens is that many artists don't want to be associated with dick at all because they think it will ruin their career. So. I will put them on projects that do not require dick. Okay. But that makes sense. Okay. That makes- yeah, but um, so when I needed an artist, they need to have the skill. They need to be available. I need to be able to afford them, and they need to be able to meet deadlines. And, okay. And to find all four um, is very rare. Um. So I'm I'm very happy. I'm working with an artist from the UK right now. Uh, his name is Byron Power. He uh, is illustrating issues three and four. Uh, I'm pl- you can find him on Instagram at byron.power. So he's he has a Patreon. Send him money because <laughs> I, I want him to survive too. Fuck yeah. Well, Brian, I, I appreciate you coming to the podcast. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. Hell yeah. And uh, listeners, we will be back. All right, bye. That was my interview with Brian Knight. You know, shout out, Brian. I appreciate you coming to the podcast. That was a good time. That was a lot of fun. Listeners, he just plugged it. I will plug it again. His Instagram, his Twitter, at Brian Knight 66 The link to his comic books, velvetcollarcomics.com. I'll put a link to both his social media as well as the comics on the Libsyn page. So make sure you go to the Libsyn page. Check that out. We are also on Instagram and Twitter at Full Service Pod. My personal Instagram and Twitter at Tank Funkadelic. The email address for the podcast, fullservicepod at gmail.com. I plug it every single week. If you want to be on the podcast, give us an email. If you want to see somebody on the podcast, you're like, hey, Tank, reach out to this person, try to make it happen. I will do that. If you just want to hear me talk about something on the podcast, send us an email, fullservicepod at gmail.com. I appreciate y'all being here. This has been episode. 30. 
If you enjoy the podcast, if you like the podcast, you're like, hey, Tank, I love what's happened here. What can I do? Subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to us on. Hit that subscribe button. If you could give us a rating, perhaps write us a review. Reviews really do help for new podcasts. We're only th- we're only 30 episodes in. We're still a baby. We're still crawling. We're still getting our feet under us. So reviews really would help. We sw- you write us a review, we mean real life. You're getting a hug from old Tank Funkadelic himself. That'd be uh, that'd be great. I really do appreciate that. We are also on YouTube as of like last week. So every episode is going on YouTube. If you search full service pod or search full service with Tank Smith, you'll find us. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube. I feel like we gotta do we gotta do something live during the quarantine. You know, quarantine sucks. Let's uh let's let's make it happen. But no, this has been episode thirty. Let's keep this uh let's keep that outro short and sweet. We will be back on Tuesday. On Tuesday, I got a solo episode coming at you. It's gonna be all about the quarantine. So uh we will be back Tuesday. Hit the subscribe button, you'll get a notification. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at full service pod tag. Stop talking, it's over. Alright, I'll see y'all later. Peace. service.